Today, we're making a simulation of colliding billiard balls in a box. And you might wonder, well, why are we doing that? Why is it interesting? Well, it turns out that these billiard balls can represent gas molecules in a gas. And as these molecules collide with each other and exchange kinetic energy and bounce off each other in collisions and, you know, over and over, they reach what's known as the Boltzmann distribution of velocities. It's a very specific distribution of the kinetic energy of molecules and a gas. It turns out that this distribution is approached no matter what the initial state of the gas is. So for example, in this video, we'll have some billiard balls coming towards the right, some coming towards the left. They'll hit each other, they'll collide, they'll bounce off the walls of the box, they'll bounce into each other over and over. And as time progresses, the distribution of velocities will slowly approach that Boltzmann distribution. Anyways, as always, like, subscribe, join the Discord server as well. There's a link down in the description below and enjoy the video. You've heard of air before. You probably breathe it in all the time. Have you ever thought what it is? Yeah. Sit down, we gonna simulate the air. Just a bunch of billiard balls, looking so fair. That's what Boltzmann said, but now he's dead. Rocking that thick beard, he got that flow on his head. If he was still kicking, then he would see. My rhymes are so crazy, they like entropy. Judy gas in a box, I'm feeling fast like an ox. So let's finish this up, cause I'm a jack in the box. Besides from normal NumPy and Matplotlib, we'll be using this uh, thing called combinations from the iter tools package. And it's a really, really powerful function and it's gonna come in handy in this video. So let's think about what we have. We have a box of particles and particles are gonna be moving around and bumping into each other and hitting off the walls, hitting each other, exchanging energy, etc. So the first thing, of course, the simplest thing is we'll define the number of particles and we're gonna start with an initial random position of these particles. Before they start moving around and everything, where do they start? So I'll just say uh, we'll have about 400 particles. And the way it's gonna work is that each particle is gonna have a random X position and a random Y position. So if I just take this code on its own here, um, and if I import my packages and I look at R, you can see that R, the shape of this array, is two by 400. So there's 400 particles and they each have an X and a Y position. And so that's sort of, I create them randomly. They're just random uniform between zero and one. So the box is zero to one in X and zero to one in Y. And I'm gonna color the particles just to make it a little bit interesting. So R zero is the X position. So these indices are the indices of the particles that start to the right. So if X is greater than 0 0.5, then the particle starts to the right. So throughout the video, by the way, R0, I'm gonna to refer to, R0 is the X component, because like I said, if I look at R, there's gonna be an X component here, and then a Y component here. So if I type R0, this is gonna show up a lot. This just refers to the X position. And of course, if I you know create a histogram of these, you can see sort of where they are in X. So all the X positions of the initial starting. And I can scatter plot the initial positions do if I do X and then Y. This is sort of the initial starting state of my system. So R0 is always X, R1 is always Y. It's something to remember for this video. So whenever X is greater than 0 0.5, they're starting to the right. And when X is less than 0 0.5, they're starting to the left. And this will just give me the indices of these positions. It's gonna be a Boolean array. So whenever it's true, it means that that particle at that position started to the right. And then the, of course the other way is to the left. And so then I can, when I create my animation, all the red ones are gonna start moving one way, the blue the other way, and then you'll see all the red and blue sort of intermingle with each other once that starts. Uh, the other thing I'm gonna do that is a little non-intuitive now, but you'll see why it comes in handy later, is I'm gonna give an ID to each particle. So there's gonna be particle zero, one, two, three, four. They're all gonna be ordered. And this will come in handy when I start doing combinations and combinatorics, which we need later in the video. So these IDs is just an array of zero up to 400. There's 400 different particles. They're all doing their thing. So we give them a separate ID. And uh, again, here I plot the initial configuration of particles. So unlike what I did above, I'm plotting only the ones that start to the right and I'm coloring them as red. And then I'm starting, I'm plotting only the ones that start to the left like this and I'm plotting those as blue. 
and you can see that I have something that looks like this. And now what we're going to do is we're going to send all the red particles moving towards the left, all the blue moving the other way, and they're going to sort of smash into each other and then all intermingle. So this coloring scheme is just something sort of fancy. And actually I did this problem in a course I was TAing for, and uh, they use this coloring scheme too. And I think it just makes it look a little nicer and gives a little bit more um, artist tick stuff to the problem, whatever that means. What do I know about art? And so we can obtain the initial velocities. So what I want to do is all the particles starting on the right hand side, all the red ones, they're moving to the left. They're going to be moving at 500 meters per second. So this is a meter and this is a meter. The reason I chose that is because 500 meters per second is the speed of actual particles in a uh, gas, you know, like the room I'm in at a normal temperature. So this is like about the speed of particles, uh, according to Google, of course, I just Googled that and it came up. So don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it's the case. And so I create the initial velocities like I did the R's. So I start by just making it all equal to zero. And if I look at V, it's going to be the same shape as R. There's going to be all the X velocities and Y velocities. And so V zero always refers to the X velocity and V one always refers to the Y velocity. So important to remember R zero is X, R one is Y, V zero is X, V one is Y. It's a two dimensional problem. So zero and one refer to those coordinates. And then all the particles that are starting to the right, I have these indices that, you know, I conveniently defined. The red particles are moving to the left at, um, well, they're moving at minus 500 meters per second. So they're going, you know, one way towards the blue. And then the blues are also going towards the red. And now, if I look at my V, it's uh, modified. So some of them are moving one way, some of them are moving the other, depending on where they initially started. So of course, the big part of the simulation, now that we have it set up, is we need to determine when the particles collide and what their final velocities are going to be. So there's two parts to this, and I'll start with the first. So the first part is that we always need to be keeping track of the distance between all pairs of particles, because if a distance between one pair is short enough, we say that it collides and then they rebound with different velocities. And of course, if you have a sphere, if you have two spheres, right, and they're colliding, as soon as the distance between their centers is less than two times their radius, if it hits two times the radius, the, the center points, then the spheres are touching and then they rebound off each other. So we want to keep track of all the distances between all the pairs. And as soon as two particles, their distances are less than or equal to two R, we need to give them their final velocities. And so in order to keep track of the distances of all pairs, we need to ID them properly. We need to have special IDs for the distances of all pairs. So if there's n particles, by the way, this is combinatorics, then there are n times n minus one over two pairs. And so we need to get pairs of particle IDs. And you'll see in like five minutes why this is really important. So that's when I use this combinations thing. So if I just type in combinations of all the IDs, so remember IDs is just zero to 400. And now I'm gonna have a list of like 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03. It's like keeping track of all the pairs. But if I just do this, it's, it's not really anything. And uh, I have to convert it to a list and then it will actually give me a list of all the pairs of IDs like this. So of course, zero one, that's the distance between particle zero and particle one, or at least we're going to ID it that way. Uh, zero two, zero three, zero four. This list is to keep track of, you know, right? Because this is the z first element of the list, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. But, you know, say I'm down here and this is the one I want to know, like, what the 100th element of the list is or like thousandth. It's going to be two weird numbers. So these will help keep track of like the order of things in a list. And then what I do is I convert it to a NumPy array. And so if I look at it like this, it's just all the way up to 398, 399. And so there's going to be n, n minus one over two. So whatever 400 times 399 is divided by two, that's how many pairs we're going to have. And we obtain the distances between particles in a really similar fashion, right? So rather than dealing with the actual IDs, I do the same thing as above but I'm going to give it the X positions. R zero is the X positions. So now I'm keeping track of all the pairs of X positions, right? So if I run this just like I ran above, this is, you know, the X position of various particles. And if I want to know what particle it is, then I look at the ID pairs array. So it helps keep track of which ones I'm actually talking about. So for example, if I'm looking at this value and it gives one X position and another X position, if I want to know what particles it's referring to, I look up here and I say, oh, it's zero and three. So it's the particle, whatever index zero and the particle at index three. So I get my X pairs. And if I want to get the distance between things, I need to take 
delta x squared plus delta y squared. So I just need to take delta between these two elements, the difference between these elements, right? And so that's really easy. Now that I have x pairs, I just take np dot diff of these pairs. And so it takes a difference and I'm taking it along the first axis, which means it's taking the difference of these elements and the length of the array is going to be however long this is like down that axis. So it takes the difference along axis number one. Once we do that, then we have dx of all the pairs. So I can do this. And so you see that I have delta x between all different pairs of particles. And again, if I'm looking at like, say the last value in the array, I know that delta x for something is 0 0.4129. The question is what pair is that? Well, then I go to my ID pairs and I say, oh, that's particle 398 and particle 399. That's the distance in x, delta x between those two pairs. And the total distance, so dij, and this is where the underscore ij, it really sort of becomes illuminated what that means. I can find a, 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 this value dij, which is just a scalar number like 0 0.4129. And ij, the subscript here refers to 398 is i and 399 is j. So those are the labels of those particles of delta x. And uh, the total distance is just delta xij squared plus delta yij squared. So of course this value delta xij, that, that's delta xij refers to 398, 399. And there's 400 particles, but there's 400 times 399 divided by two, which is a large number of pairs. So there's a lot of dij values. And so I get all my x pairs, my y pairs. I can use that to get dx and dy like I did above with dx. And then D is just the square root of DX pairs squared plus DY pairs squared, right? Like this is just an array of numbers. So I take this squared plus the Y values squared and I get all my distances squared. And this is the array that I'm really interested in because each time I iterate or each time I go through the simulation, I want to check all these values. And if there's a pair, right? Suppose I'm talking about 398, 399 and this value here is smaller than two times the radius, I want to make a check for all these values in this array and say, well, if it's less than two times the radius of these spheres, then I look at the pair here and then I modify the velocities of that pair. So that's really why these IDs come in handy here because with this pair array, I can have all my distances, right? There's 400 particles, there's gonna be 400 times 399 divided by two. This is a long array. If I look at the size of this array, 79,800, right? So there's a lot of different pairs for 400 particles. And if I want if these values are small enough, the ones that are small enough, then I go to the IDs and I modify the velocities of those IDs. So then the question is when the two spheres collide, what are the final velocities of that collision, right? That's, that's something we need to think about. So we'll check, we'll iterate, we'll move the particles slowly. We check to make sure they're not touching. If two of them are in that you know, distance within each other, we need to change their velocities. And so the distance of any of the particles, if it's less than two R, where R is the radius, then a collision occurs. And so you have to wonder what is the final velocity of that collision? Well, it turns out that if you assume they're elastic, which is true of a gas, right? If the collisions weren't elastic in a gas, it would be getting colder and colder and colder. So generally in a gas, you have elastic collisions, which means conservation of energy holds. So you assume conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum. And you can show that if you have two particles colliding, uh, the velocity, the new velocity of the first one is its initial velocity minus this product. This is just a dot product between the difference of the velocities, difference of positions, um, a factor here, and then the difference of the positions. And the same thing with the second particle. So that'll tell me, you know, two spheres are coming like this. They bounce off each other and they kind of go like this. I can look at this equation and that will tell me um, exactly what direction they're going to be going in. And of course the direction they go in R1 minus R2 is the vector connecting the centers of the sphere. So this vector, when two spheres touch, they're always rebounding like opposite of the way that the circles touch. So if they come on an angle like this, right, the vector going between their centers points like this way, and then they rebound like that. So that's something interesting. You can sort of read into that equation and we can just use this to modify. So, we have all the IDs of the pairs, we check which ones are less than a certain distance, and then we modify their velocities like this. And so that's pretty easy. So say the radius is 0 0.06, and I come up with these IDs pair collide. So these are all the pairs of IDs, which are those lists of like 0, 01, 0, 02, all the way to 398, 399. And I wanna find it, so let's, let's recall what these arrays are. So I have D pairs, 
and the size of this array, this is all the different pairs that I have, right? So 79,800. And I want to look where these values are less than two times the radius. And I said the radius was 0 0.06. So if I look at this and I just say, well, let's find all the values here where it's less. Uh, I haven't defined radius. I'll run that cell in a second, but it'll give me an array of falses and trues. And so there are going to be certain locations where this holds. And at those locations, I want to get the pair, the IDs of those pairs where that is holding. So I can run this cell and I look at all the pairs that collide. And so these are all the different pairs of particles that are going to be colliding in this case. And so actually to start, I have 400 particles. I'm going to rerun everything just with 10 particles because this is going to or 16 because this is going to come in handy for when we do our first uh, simulation. So let's make sure that we get um, 16 here. I'm going to rerun everything. And I have all my distances, so it's much smarter, shorter now. And so when I start the simulation and they're first moving, there are five pairs of these spheres, right, at the first time step that are touching. So zero and two, those two are colliding, right, off the bat. Uh, two and 15, three and six, four and seven, five and nine. You'll see that I have five and nine and not nine and five. It's not repeated. And that's one of the really nice things about the uh, uh, iter tools packages that it'll give these things without um, sort of the flipped repeat. And so then what I need to do is all these particles that are colliding, I need to change their velocities using these equations here. So first, let's actually get the velocities and positions of all of these, you know, IDs. So it's a little bit confusing here, but I'll, I'll show you sort of what I'm doing. So the left column is going to be, we're going to call all these particles V1. And we're going to do this all at once because it's easier. So there's going to be a lot of different values. There's going to be like five different V1s and there's going to be five different V2s. Those are all these particles. And we'll do array operations to make everything really fast. So 0, 2, 3, 4, and 5. These are all the ones we're going to call V1. And 2, 15, 6, 7, 9. These are all the ones we're going to call V2. So I can get my ID pairs collide, this array. And if I index it like this, I just get 0, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So semicolon and then 0. That's just the way that you index NumPy arrays. And I want to get the velocities at these values. So for that, remember my velocities looks like this. So there's going to be 16 x values and 16 y values. And I can index that by saying, well, I'm going to index over um, you know, the first axis. And then I only want um, you know, 0. So that'll be these two values. 2, that'll be these two values. 4, and then 5. So I plug this in, indexing using this array. And I get all my x positions and all my y positions. So of course, v1, right, which is just you know two things. This is the first thing we're going to call v1. There's another v1 that's going to look like this. Another v1 that's going to look like this. Remember, because x and y velocity. So we have them all going on at once, right? And then we do the same thing for the right-hand column as well. So how I did this. And I get my V1s like that, my V2s, my R1s, and my R2s. So I have five different V1s, five different V2s, five different R1s, five different R2s. And you might wonder, why am I doing them all at once? Well, it's more efficient to do that in Python for one. And this equation here looks a little bit weird when I do this in NumPy. And I think this is the most confusing part of the video, especially if you're just watching and you haven't done stuff like this before. So in order to do a dot product, and what I'm doing here is I'm doing a dot product with many vectors at once. I have five different pairs of particles colliding, and I want to do like this, basically all five at the same time in this thing. So I need to put things into matrices, right? And so this dot product between V1 and V2 and R1 and R2, well, I have multiple values of V1, multiple values of V2, same thing with R1 and R2, right? And if I look at my V1 minus V2, it's not going to look like a vector. It's a list of vectors. So this is my first vector, my second vector, my third vector, my fourth vector, and my fifth vector. I'm doing five things at once. And so this is actually a matrix, right? And if I want to take a dot product, it turns out that I take the transpose of this, I use the matrix multiplication operator, and I do that with R1 minus R2, like that. That'll give me a matrix, and then I take the diagonal of that matrix. So it's confusing, and it's, it's something worth thinking about. Then I get the dot, I have five values. So I'm taking the dot product of five different vectors and I get five different values. So this is how a dot product works like this. 
Uh, the other things are easy. So the R1 minus R2 squared, I just sum this along a certain axis because R1 minus R2 squared, of course, this is also going to be a matrix. And I need to sum these together because right, R1 minus R2 squared, I, need, I, I have a vector. I have five vectors that I'm doing this to. And if I sum this along this axis and I get my distances between all five pairs of vectors, and then I multiply by R1 minus R2 and I get my new arrays like this. And I should have five new pairs for each. So V1 new, I have one, two, three, four, five pairs. And V2 new, I also have five pairs. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the dot product. You know, I have five different collisions occurring and I'm doing them all at the same time in NumPy. And that's confusing. So I encourage you, it, it's not so easy to understand, but if you go through the code and break it down, especially an expression like this, maybe you'll get more idea of what's going on. So we basically have everything we need to run the simulation at this point. So what we're gonna do is we have all our particles, they're moving at different velocities. We're gonna iterate delta t, they're all gonna move with v delta t, they're just gonna move a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And there's a lot of code here, but essentially that's what I'm doing here. I think it's important to do this first because that's essentially the you know main thing of the simulation is we're moving the particles closer and closer. And so we'll iterate, 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 iterate. And every time we iterate, we check if the distances are close enough together such that a collision occurs. And so everything I've done here is what I've done above. So this here is getting delta pairs. That's either like X or Y, and it will get the distance like delta X between the pairs, delta Y between the pairs. Delta D between the pairs, that's all the code that we've gone over above. It's just getting the delta X pairs, remember R0 is X, plus the delta Y pairs. And this will give you delta D for all the different pairs that are colliding in this case. Uh, this is just compute new, uh, new V, that's what we did above, and it gives uh, these new things here. And so the only new thing here is the motion. So what are we doing here? Well, I'm creating this thing called R's and V's, and it's a three-dimensional array, even though it's a 2D simulation. But the third dimension is time. So we're gonna take a bunch of snapshots, right? in time that keeps our array 3d so we have a 2d picture 2d picture 2d picture 2d picture it's like a movie and so that's the first um uh axis here is the time axis and then we have x and we have y and we're going to just set the initial state equal to the initial r's which we set above and the initial v's as well and then we iterate so we go from one to the number of time steps ts is for time steps in the uh simulation so IC is the indices of collision, IC index collision. And it's the same thing that I did above. I say I get all the delta D of all my pairs. And if that's less than D cutoff, which I feed to the function, then that becomes the pairs of IDs that are colliding. And then I use that with my compute new, uh, compute new V, which is essentially what I did here uh, when I showed how to do this. Remember IDs pair collide. That's essentially what IC is here. I pass it to this function and I get my new velocities of all the pairs that are colliding. And the other thing I need to do is that some of the particles will leave the box. If they hit the end of the box, they bounce back with the same velocity. So it's an elastic collision off the box and it keeps all the particles confined to the box and not leaving the box. So this is something just to make sure that they're not leaving the box. So this zero is X, right? And I say that if my X is greater than one, remember R zero is X, then the velocity needs to go backwards to keep it in the box. And if it's going left, if R0 is less than zero, it needs to go in the opposite direction. That's essentially what I'm setting here. Then R, you do the next iteration, they all move a little bit. So they have the velocity, delta T, and they move, and they move, and they move, and you do this for like thousands of iterations, some of them will collide, and you get a sort of animation of what's going on. And then I append R's I, which of course is this uh, frame, I is the time step of this uh, array, I set that equal to the current value of R. So I'm sort of creating a picture book of all the different time steps of the particles moving closer and closer together. So I have all my functions. I set my radius as 0.06 in this case. I'm gonna go for a, a thousand time steps and the cutoff of course is two times the radius like we said, that's true for spheres. So I can go like this, I get all my, um, my motion. It runs very quickly because I don't have very many particles and I can plot this, the red and blue circles. And so this is really simple. This is just to make sure our simulation is working properly. We'll create an animation and we'll make sure that the balls are bouncing off each other in the right way. So I have some code to animate this and I plot circles red and circles blue. This is a plot.circle function. You probably haven't seen it before, 
but it's a way of plotting circles on a plot that are the radius that you specify. And I wanted the radiuses to be exact because I want to make sure that the spheres collide as soon as their edges are touching. So that's why I have this here. And then I add them to the plot. I'm making sure to make some of them red and some of them blue. And uh, that's based on this IXR and IXL, which I defined way back at the beginning of the video. And so I can save this animation. So as you can see, the animation worked pretty well. The circles are bouncing off each other. And as soon as they reach the edge, they're bouncing back. So this gives us confirmation that whatever is working is working good. So the animation seemed to work well. So now that we confirm that, we're going to do a simulation containing many, many more particles. So we're going to do 400 particles this time. And this is just basically running everything I had above, except with 400 particles. And we can an make an animation of this and see what's going on. So the animation is done and the, you can see the particles are very small here, but what they're doing is they're colliding off the side, they're colliding into each other and they're moving around, you know, sort of like this. And so initially, although they started on different sides, they're now colliding with each other in the box. You can see the red and the blues hitting into each other and then they start sort of intermingling with each other. What we're interested in is over time, what does the distribution of velocities of these particles look like? So I want to look at the final velocity distribution. When we're done the simulation and the particles are sort of reached their equilibrium state, what does the distribution of velocities look like? So at the very end, we'll take the last time step. We'll look at the distribution of velocities and we're going to compare it to Maxwell Boltzmann, the distribution they have for particles in a gas in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, we have KT is equal to the average kinetic energy. And you can solve for M over KT is two over V bar squared. But the reason why we solve for this is because the Boltzmann distribution in 2D depends on m over kt. So if I plug in 2 over v bar squared into this formula here, I have everything I need. I know what v bar squared is because I have my initial velocities and the average kinetic energy isn't going to change in this system because everything's elastic. So v bar squared, the average, which of course the, it's related to the average kinetic energy, um, it's proportional directly to it. Um, you know, we plug this in, we have 2 over v bar squared v, and then 2 over v bar squared shows up here as well. And we know exactly what f of v is. So I have my v is equal to, I'm going to go from 0 to 2,000 meters per second. It's, it's a good range. Uh, a, which is m over kt, I just call that a, is 2 over 500 squared because that's the initial v squared values. And then I get my uh, Boltzmann distribution f of v here like this. And then what I do is I bin all the final velocities, which is uh, v's negative 1. I square them, so my v is negative 1, right? It's going to be, have my x and my y positions. I square both of them, and I sum it along the 0th axis. And that gives x squared plus y squared. And that's my distribution of my v's squared, and then I take the square root of that to get the distribution of v. And uh, that's what I do here, mp dot square root. I bin it, and I plot it next to the distribution. And you can see that at the very end, the distribution really starts to look like this. Whereas at the first time step, before things begin, of course, everything is moving at 500 meters per second. So over time, as I go through my time steps, you can see that it, it sort of starts to slowly approach the Boltzmann distribution. And so we can make an animation of that. And what I want to do is I want to show the particles colliding into each other next to the histogram. And you'll see that as the particles start to intermingle with each other, the histogram shape will start to change. And so that's the final plot or animation of this video. And so we have our final animation here. And I made the size of the particles a little bit bigger because I noticed the other one was a bit small. And I have, have my histogram on the right here and the particles on the left. And let me zoom out a little bit here. But you can see that as the particles collide into each other, this slowly approaches the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And I'll sort of let it play a few times so that you can see what's uh, going on here. So they're colliding, they first start, they're all bouncing off the back. And as they collide more and more with each other, the distribution of velocities approaches this probability density function, which is to me like sort of non-trivial. But that exchange of velocities in those two equations, if that happens over and over and over and you do it over and over between random particles over and over, you can mathematically prove that this is the distribution that they will approach. And of course, this is in two dimensions, but this holds in three dimensions as well. Only, of course, it's a little bit different. 
Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, as always, like, subscribe, join the Discord server. There's probably going to be a few other things soon as well. So definitely subscribe to this channel. I have lots of exciting stuff planned for the future. Anyways, I'll see you guys next time.